Good morning, everybody. Okay. Uh, welcome to this uh, seminar at the Instituto de Astrofisica Andalusia. And uh, today we have uh, the talk by Dr. Giovanni Miru, and he will talk about detailed equilibrium and dynamical tides. So I will make a short introduction of uh, uh, Giovanni. He obtained his uh, PhD in 2016 from the University of Toulouse in France. Then he moved to the International School of Advanced Studies System in Trieste, Italy. And then uh, he worked at the University of Surrey in United Kingdom before coming to Granada at the uh, university currently. He's working as a postdoc researcher at the University of Granada with uh, Dr. Juan Carlos Suarez and uh, Dr. Antonio Garcia. Uh, his research is focuses on astroseismology, evolution and population of intermediate to high mass stars that are often uh, rotating rapidly and or on binary system. He's involved in the Kepler test and now, of course, on Plato uh, collaboration. So thank you very much, uh, Giovanni, for accepting this uh, invitation. And the floor is yours. I will unmute. In here, thank you for inviting me for this uh, seminar. Um, so indeed, I'm going to talk about detailed tides, uh, basically uh, tides and their impact on circularization, synchronization in cluster populations. So I come from a, a modeling side of things, but um, hopefully there's also some for observation people. Um, I'll start with a short summary of uh, thorough evolution. So sorry for the Zoom thing kind of uh, eating on the title there. But, um, so basically single star evolution, um, when you want to evolve stars, uh, textbooks will tell you that everything depends on the initial mass of the star. You just have to know that and then everything follows. Well, of course, terms and conditions apply. Uh, you also have to know the initial composition of your star, the mixing properties inside the star, whatever additional physics you may want to include, such as um, rotation, magnetic fields, you have to well, use a prescription for that. And you have to know the microphysics, such as the equations of state and the opacities. So it's actually more complicated than that. Uh, and star evolution codes, they always uh, follow the same scheme, more or less. You start from a given model that contains all that input. Um, you take a time step where you compute how much material you're going to burn, uh, well, to fuse, for instance, in the core. You update the composition, you update the structure, and then you repeat these time steps. So that's for single stars. Now for binary stars, uh, obviously it's trickier. You have two stars, so you need to do twice the work for the structure of those stars. But you also need to constrain the orbit and the interactions between the stars. So here is an example of uh, Alpha Canis Majoris uh, orbit. Uh, the interesting bit here is the period, of course. So the time it takes for the binary star, to, for, for the companion to rotate around the, the, the main star and um, the eccentricity. Obviously, this is not circular, but it might be. Um, so um, we always, obviously, the two stars rotate, both of them around the center of mass of that system. But we always look at the, that problem in this way, where the most massive star, the primary, is fixed. And the secondary, the least massive star, rotates around the primary. So I'm going to talk a lot about periods and eccentricities. I just want this to be uh, very clear. Uh, of course, you can do detailed modeling of binary stars. So you have to do all the things I described up there. So that's a lot of parameters. Um, it is quite slow because every time you have interactions between the stars, these interactions tend to be slow, uh, to be, sorry, very rapid. So you have to uh, resolve that with a lot of small time steps. And uh, that gives you a weird stellar objects such as subdwarf B stars or supernovae, a type 1A supernovae think that, well, you have to also model. Um, when I mention interactions, there are three kinds of them. The first one is tides. So tides happen in closed detached binaries. 
So here you have a system that has two stars that are not so close to each other. They're close, but they're not touching. That's what I mean. Uh, well, that triggers tides. Each star makes the other star move. And those tides induce uh, dissipation through friction, mostly. And that leads to circularized orbits. So the orbits lose in eccentricity over time and uh, to a synchronization of the stellar spins with the orbital period. So in the end, everything rotates with the same period. Um, the other interactions, I'm not gonna delve into them, but we are also interested in modeling those. There is mass transfer when the stars get so close to each other and one of them evolves to the red giant branch and seals basically the domain it can attract gravitationally to the point that some of the material at the surface is actually more attracted by the companion. So you have exchanges of mass. And you have a common envelope phases where the two stars are basically surrounded by a thin envelope that includes the two of the two stars. And the question is basically, do the stars necessarily merge? Uh, do they sometimes survive? We know they do. So they sometimes survive. Uh, how much mass is ejected and so on? I'm not going to delve into these two uh, more intense interactions. The talk of today is about tides. Um, so I mentioned circularization. So the impact of, on, of tides is to uh, dissipate the eccentricity of a binary system. Uh, here you have uh, on the right a plot. So all the plots, most plots I'm going to show today are uh, eccentricity as a function of the logarithm of the orbital period. Um, if you start with systems that are originally eccentric, so here we started from systems that all have eccentricity of 0.6, and we evolve them with time, but the closest systems will see the eccentricity dissipate and will become circular, not necessarily much smaller in period, as you can see, the, those evolution tracks are pretty vertical in the plot, so a period barely changes, but much more circular. And the more you wait, the more systems become circular. Basically systems at higher periods become circular because tides have had more time to act on them. Um, we use this uh, progressive um, circularization with period of a time as an indicator of age in populations that contain binary stars, for instance, clusters. So a lot of what I'm going to tell you about today is related to this age estimate that you can derive from the amount of circularized systems you have. Um, this circularization is seen in actual data. So here you have two clusters on the left, M35. So I'm going to point with my mouse here. Uh, M35 here, you see that you have a population of circular systems below 100 days in period. And eccentric systems are only there from 10 days upwards. So you have a region at short period where all systems are circular, a region at high period, a large period where the systems are eccentric to various degrees, and in the middle you have a mixed bunch. M35 here has half solar metallicity more or less. It's a large magnetic cloud cluster, I think. Um, it is not very old, 150 mega years, and it contains solar-like stars. So stars with a convective envelope, this will turn uh, crucial later. On the right, you have Tarantula. Tarantula is definitely in the large Magellanic cloud. It's also half solar in metallicity. It's much younger and contains very, very massive stars. Uh, o stars between 20 and 80 solar masses. There are actually some stars that reach allegedly 320 solar masses. That would be the most massive star we, all, we ever observed. Uh, it's in Tarantula as well. And here again, you have the same composition with circularized systems up to 20 days. All systems below three days being totally circular and systems above three days, somewhat eccentric. Some are very eccentric like this one here. Um, so basically we want to explain this through tides and see how our explanation will match the age estimates. Uh, to do that, we use uh, models. So to model a population, there's a crucial point, a technical point that I want to make. You need to compute many, many stars. In my case, the simulations are going to, I'm going to show are just shy of 1 million stars. Well, 1 million binary systems, actually, uh, in there. 
To do that, you need both adequate initial conditions for your parameters and a rapid evolution algorithm. You cannot afford to compute the whole structure of the stars through time for each of those 1 million uh, binary stars. Uh, to do that, we use the binary C code. Uh, that's an open source code that has been developed by uh, Robert Itzard, my former supervisor in the UK. Um, and I used it for clusters, but you could use it for galactic populations like the disk or the halo or even entire galaxies. Uh, it would still work, just take more time. Um, so I mentioned initial parameters. We used two uh, initial distributions for the parameters. One is uh, relies on the Krupa initial mass function. So the initial mass function is the distribution of masses at stellar formation. Um, Krupa is a very classic one. Uh, we do not change it in the study, so that's not one of our parameters. But what we do change is the distribution of period and eccentricities at zero age main sequence. So we use uh, first the Duqueno and Mayor prescription. So that's simply the product of two Gaussians, one on eccentricity, one on period. And that gives you uh, an initial distribution for those parameters. The other one we use is the Mo and the Stefano uh, distribution. This one is much more recent. It has been um, deduced from bias-corrected obs bias observations. So they look through various pipelines, various surveys at various populations in the galaxy, and then they try to infer what the original uh, eccentricity and period distributions were. This is a much more complex law. It's actually tabulated data and not just Gaussians. Um, I'm going to use these two short hands here uh, at some point in the talk, DM91 for the uh, Gaussian distributions, MS17 for the um, updated, well, for the empirical prescription, basically. Uh, I also mentioned the rapid evolution algorithm. Well, there are two of them in binary C. The older one is called um, BSE for binary star evolution. That one relies on the interpolation of grids of models that were computed in 1998. From those, uh, inter uh, from those, no, not interpolation, sorry. Uh, from those fits they performed on the models, on the parameters, they gave fitting formulae so that everything depends on metallicity and mass. And um, yeah, well, when you want to know the parameters of your star, you just feed those formulae, your mass and your metallicity, and that gives you the parameters you need to uh, keep evolving your systems. The other, uh, the other uh, algorithm that I developed during my uh, three years in the UK um, is called MINT. So it relies on grids of MESA models. MESA is a state-of-the-art stellar revolution code in 1D. Um, we build grids with various that cover the, the mass range we want, the metallicity range, metallicity range we want. And uh, the good thing about this is that we can change the physics and just compute a new, new grid plug it in the code, and the code will basically interpolate those grids to find the star parameters it requires. Um, so this modularity and bespoke physics uh, character is very useful and it's a very, very interesting upgrade. Um, so I'm going to give you a bit more details here. Um, the improvements we did with Mint include changing the, physics to the clock uh, to evil stars from the age to a more physical thing, because when you have mass transfer, your age sort of loses its meaning and stars can have ages that you would not expect for a single star. So it's confusing. And even in terms of coding, it was coded in a confusing way in BSC. So we fixed that by looking at physical criteria in the star that actually match track the evolution in, in a given phase and serve as an age proxy. Um, we replace the tides. This will be the main focus on my future uh, slides. And uh, we scan a wider parameter range. So here at the bottom, you have an idea of the upgrade we did. So originally the code was sampling masses up to 80 solar masses for metallicities that were non-zero, so population two stars up to 3% uh, metals. We extended both ranges. So now we can go up to 1000 solar masses. So those stars are not expected to exist. I know that. But um, if we have 300 solar masses that do exist and can be in binary systems, technically you could go up to 600. So you want to cover at least that. 
And in terms of uh, metallicity, we can go from actually zero to 4%. So actually zero is interesting because uh, I will show you some results on population three stars that are the original, well, primary, primordial stars created in the universe and that have no metals at all. Here on the right, you have an example of an HR diagram uh, at two person metals. Uh, there are two main differences. Uh, the one here, so when you use, uh, sorry, I should be more careful. So it's an HRD, you have luminosity versus effective temperature. The gray tracks that you can guess here and there are what you get from BSC prescriptions. And the colored tracks are what you get with the new implementation mint. Uh, as you can see, the zero H mint sequence is slightly different for high mass stars. And especially it turns back to higher, um, to lower temperatures, sorry, for very massive stars. This is expected and not included at all in the old prescriptions. And the terminal age main sequence also results in much more, uh, much colder stars, because basically they tend to extend towards the end of the. Oh, nice, thanks. Uh, so here, uh, the, these stars tend to extend towards the end of the main sequence. That's also something that we see, and that is not included in BSC. Um, thank you. Um, so I mentioned tides. So now I should explain basically what happens there. Uh, you have two kinds of tides in stars. One is the dynamical tide, the other one is called the equilibrium tide. So the dynamical tide that I described here, um, this tide is due to waves propagating inside the star and dissipating energy. These are very specific gravity waves that are created at the core uh, envelope boundary. And uh, they look like this. So you see that a shear layer is emitted here and just bounces around. And because it's so thin, it dissipates energy locally in the star. And that energy actually comes from the orbit of the system. Um, so you modify the orbit through that uh, pipeline. Uh, these only happen in stars that have a convective core and a radiative envelope. They might have another convective zone at the surface. We don't care about that one. But they have to have a core that's convective and envelope that's radiative. Um, and the time scales here, so you have formula for the inverse time scale. So I kept that uh, weird formalism, but both of them, they are proportional to this quantity called E2. So E2 is a complicated parameter here. So you can see that it relates to the density at the core boundary uh, interface. Here, this term here is the stratification the Brunvisola frequency for those of you that are familiar with it. So uh, you have the stratification inside the star. And H2 here is a nightmare uh, parameter that you have to compute by solving various uh, differential equations inside the star. But in the end, you get this parameter that depends on mass and H. In BSC, uh, the parameter E2 was assumed to uh, depend only on mass. So the dissipation through uh, dynamical tides would be the same throughout the stellar evolution. And this is clearly not correct, as we will see here. Here I compare my calculation of E2, so the various lines here, with uh, the BSC prescription that are just dots here, because remember, they do not depend on age. This plot here shows E2 as a function of the central hydrogen mass fraction. So age goes from left to right with star forming here at 0.7 and Obviously, here, uh, they start going to the red giant branch. Um, so what we see is that E2 starts at a rather high value. So you have uh, a high E2 means short time scales for circularization and synchronization. So tides are efficient at first. And then the more you move on the main sequence, the less tides are uh, become, well, the, the more tides become sort of inefficient. Uh, this is in log scale, by the way. And here you have the masses of the various uh, stars that are plotted on the plot here. Uh, if you compare that with the prescriptions from BSC, you can find that uh, BSC is always overestimating the tide efficiency at zero age main sequence. And then because the value does not go down with time, it keeps overestimating more and more the efficiency of tide, of, uh, of dynamical tide. Um, OK. Now I told you there's another kind of tides, the equilibrium tide. Well, that one is simply due to the distortion imposed by the gravitational pull of the companion, just like the moon on the earth. Uh, your, your primary star becomes distorted and this 
distortion, distortion bulge rotates with the star. And as long as there is no synchronicity between the rotation and the motion, you have some friction that dissipates energy. Um, that happens in stars that have a convective surface or that are fully convective for that matter. And again, we have a formula for the time scales that depend this time on these coefficients lambda. And this, uh, this ratio lambda divided by the convective turnover time, uh, they are proportional to this. And that means in the end that they are uh, depending on this parameter E that depends on the envelope mass uh, well, the percentage of the star that is convective and the properties inside the convective zone. Um, again, we compute E to compare with the prescriptions from BSC. And what we find is that, um, well, so here you have the mass again for this time convective stars. And what we find is that E is uh, the highest for fully convective stars, at least at zero H main sequence here. And then when stars start building a, a radiative core, uh, E falls. And if stars already form with a radiative core, such as a one solar mass track here, well, the value is already smaller. Again, small E means inefficient tides, large E means uh, efficient tides. The black line here is the prescription from ZAN for uh, fully convective stars. So you can see that the value matches our zero H main sequence, very low mass stars as expected, and then stops matching the actual data later on. Uh, you can also see here very massive stars popping in the plot. Well, this is due to the fact that those stars develop a convective envelope when they become very bloated at the end of their main sequence. And if they have a convective envelope, then they have equilibrium tides along with the radiative tides we discussed before. Um, so, these values can actually get pretty high. That has never been implemented in codes that I know of um, because well, there aren't many codes studying those very, very, very massive stars, but it could be in the future. Um, yes, so now I'm showing you uh, populations we computed with these new title implementations. So these plots uh, require that I spend a bit of time uh, telling you what's in there. So again, it's eccentricity versus orbital period in log. Um, the color map here is the result of our uh, modeling. So we compute the population. We look at a given age, in this case, 150 mega years, the age of the cluster. We look at the distribution of eccentricities and period. We bin them and uh, each bin here is assigned a color that matches this scale here linear scale. So on the left here, you have many stars predicted to be here, uh, no star predicted to be in the top left corner here, and a few there. The red crosses are the observed binary systems. Yes. Well, we are here. I only keep, I only keep binary stars because I'm looking at the eccentricity period diagram. But I can include the single stars as well. Yeah. Uh, well, the, yeah. Uh, so for people on Zoom, uh, I'm, I'm asked if I include single stars in the pipeline for this population calculation, or if I only consider binaries. So the answer would be, uh, normally, if you want to model the whole cluster, you would include both. And the Mo and the Stefano prescription I mentioned, or uh, the, the older Duqueno and Mayor prescription, they both give you a binary fraction for each mass range. In this specific case, I only included binary stars because I'm only interested in looking at the circularization and that's you know, irrelevant for single stars. But technically you can do both. And if you want to model the clusters from other aspects than this, you would have to. Okay, that answers your question. Yeah. Okay, um, so I, I was telling you about the color map being the population we model and the red crosses are the measured um, binary systems, so their orbital period and eccentricity. On the left here, 
I used the Duke and one Mayor prescription, so the Gaussian initial distributions for eccentricities and periods. On the right here, I used the Mo and the Stefano distribution, um, so the empirically uh, inferred prescriptions for uh, periods and eccentricities. Uh, what you can see here is that on the left, there's a massive distribution here because the Gaussians peak there and they basically create this structure. And when we evolve the system, the, the cluster for 150 mega years, it doesn't dissipate into, uh, at all, basically. And you can see that this bunch of circularized systems between three and 100 days of period, they're basically not modeled by the, like the, there's no density there for our model population. On the contrary, when using the Mo and the Stefano distribution, uh, well, this part at low eccentricities is taken into account, is accounted for. Uh, it, that's actually where you have the most density uh, in the plot from the model, model population. And you can also see there's a secondary node here that includes the high eccentricity, high period systems that did not have time to circularize yet. Um, so these two calculations were done using the BSC tight that I told you are, we expect to be uh, grossly overrated. Uh, so I have the same plots for the mint uh, tight. So these two plots I just showed you, they're the same. And these two on the bottom are computed using the same, well, using either the Duke one Maya or the Mo and the Stefano initial distribution, but using different tights. And you can see that they look pretty much the same. On the left here, you find some circularized systems at very low periods that do not really match the observed ones. And you still have that massive bulge at higher uh, eccentricities and periods. While with the mint tide, well, you have still that uh, nice circularized uh, density, the main mode and the second mode that, that uh, accounts for the large non-circularized systems. Um, just to, uh, to make sure, I was kind of surprised when I first got this result, so I checked these two plots are indeed different. I did not plot the same data despite them looking very, very similar. They're not the same. I actually checked this using different types, the newer types. Okay, so this is for equilibrium types because this cluster, uh, I should remind you, only has solar-like stars, so between 0.7 and 1.4. Uh, solar masses, convective surfaces. So th that's equilibrium tides. So we also look at Tarantula, our O star cluster, uh, that, would uh, that would require dynamical tides here. And uh, we have the same thing. So this is with Gaussian distributions and BSC tides on the top left. Top right is uh, Mint tides. Uh, sorry, it's BSC tides, but still Mo and, the, but this Mo and the Stefano distributions. And the bottom row is Mint tides on the left with Gaussians, on the right with uh, Mo and the Stefano distributions. Um, so what we see here again is uh, for Gaussian distributions, we see that um, main mode at high, free, uh, high eccentricity, high period, and the secondary mode that accounts for the closest, uh, most circularized systems, but not all of them. Like there's a population here around 10 days that is not taken into account when using Gaussians. And that's the case whether you use BSC or um, mint tides. But when you use the Mo and the Stefano initial distribution, you find the main mode where you have many circularized systems and the secondary distribution that accounts for the most ex the uh, more eccentric systems. And the same thing with mint tides. It's even more pronounced with mint tides. Mint tides, you have like the main mode here and some kind of a tail that goes diagonally for higher periods and eccentricities. Um, so clearly these two uh, fit better using uh, Mo and the Stefano distributions, but there's no real difference between using uh, mint tides, the bottom rows, or BSC tides, the top rows. Um, I'm, you're, at this point, you're probably uh, not satisfied in this demonstration because I'm just showing you plots and they, I'm telling you, well, these things look the same. Uh, trust me, trust your eyes. You shouldn't do that. Uh, we do statistics as well. Uh, so I'm going to, to summarize very briefly the kind of statistics we do. And the pointer just broke in my head, so it still works, okay. Um, so the test for the statistical match, we basically extract from the model population randomly 
a set of binary systems, modeled binary systems, that uh, is the same size as the observed sample. Then we compute the comparison with the observed sample through a two-dimensional kolmogorov smirnov test. I will not delve into it because I already forgot what it was about, but it's trustworthy. Uh, and that gives you a distance to the observations. So on this plot here, you have the statistical distance as uh, well, versus the normalized count. And the black line here is the best you can do. Basically, if everything is random, uh, you get the black line here. Uh, it, it, what you want to do is to be uh, as close to the left, to the vertical axis as you can be on this plot. The closer you are means that your distribution from the population versus the observed sample match each other. So here you have the, da the dashed line here that agree together and are much closer than the solid lines that also agree with each other. And that's the case for M35 and for Tarantula. The dashed lines are what you get from the Mo and the Stefano initial distributions with either mint or BSC tides. So either the old or the new implementation of tides, they give you more or less the same statistics. And the solid lines are what you get uh, using Gaussian initial distributions. So what we can understand from this is that clearly Mo and the Stefano initial distributions give you a better agreement between theory and observations, but changing from BSC to mint tides does not change that agreement significantly. Um, we confirm that by modulating the tides, either BSC or mint, uh, by multiplying them by a factor between zero and 1000. And what we find is this plot here where you have the distance between observations and theory as a function of the tidal strength factor. So that's multiplicative factor we arbitrarily put in the code. Um, and what you would expect is that the agreement should improve, but here every line is flat, basically. So flat line means multiplying the tides does, does not improve or worsen the agreement. So there is basically no impact from the tides, even if you multiply them by 1000 on the agreement between theory and observations. Uh, we were not really expecting that result, but it means that tides on the main sequence cannot con uh, cannot circularize the systems, or you can take the system the the the, the ID the other way. Circularization does not let you uh, estimate tidal efficiency on the main sequence. Um, so that's the first bit of conclusions for for this part of the work. Um, tides do not give you the age on the main sequence, despite all our best effort. Uh, and uh, in the same way, you could, uh, well, okay. Because it's the initial distribution that tell you what the agreement between theory and observation is, it's whatever gives you that initial distribution. And what gives you that initial distribution is what happens on the pre-main sequence. And that is where tides are going to have an impact. So pre-main sequence tides are more important than main sequence tides. And uh, this can be explained quite easily because the circularization time scale scales with the radius of the star to the power minus eight. And three main sequence stars are larger than on the main sequence where you have dwarfs. So during that contraction phase, before the stars ignite hydrogen in the core, that is where tides will, impact, will have an impact. And that gives you the initial distributions from Mo and the Stefano that match our uh, observed system so well. Yeah. Yes. Yes, so uh, Adrian is asking me if tides are used, well, to confirm basically that, uh, yes, tides are more important on the pre-main sequence, much more uh, impactful on the pre-main sequence than on the main sequence. And they become impactful again during the red giant branch, by the way, where stars also grow. Yeah, yeah, well, then tides become, used, become you know, significant again because the size of the star uh, becomes larger. Basically, the E2 or E factor in those uh, derivations does not have the same kind of impact on the efficiency of tides as the stellar radii. So what you really want to look at is the stellar radius rather than the rather than the multiplic well the, the tidal factor basically. Welcome. Okay, so 
at this point, you could think, okay, well, so ties are useless. Uh, why am I following this talk? Uh, there, is a, there is some hope, uh, some light at the end of the tunnel in synchronization. Uh, I told you that tides also synchronize stellar spins with the orbital period so that in the end, both stars have a rotation period that matches the orbital period. Well, this process might happen during the main sequence. So we, investigating, we investigated that. The process also depends on E and E2. So there's nothing new to compute except uh, look at the rotation in those stellar populations I mentioned. Um, there's one caveat here. This, is, this has never been used as an age indicator because observational constraints are very rare. You need to have both, uh, well, to measure orbit parameters, um, fundamental parameters of the two stars involved and their rotation rate, which uh, is a complicated set of observations to have simultaneously. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about here is more of a proof of concept than anything else. Um, so again, we will repeat from various rotational prescriptions that I'm not going to delve into because they give the same result. But we also test initial rotation, but we keep testing the same things as before, tides uh, from BSC versus Mint, and um, initial distributions from Gaussians versus empirical. And uh, okay, here's another set of uh, colored plots. They're slightly different from the previous ones. Here, uh, the horizontal axis is still the orbital period in log scale, but the vertical here, uh, scale, is uh, the ratio of the rotation rate to the synchronized one, again in log. So a star that, we, well, zero stars that are basically along this line in the middle, uh, they are synchronized with the orbit. And stars that are at plus or minus one rotate 10, 10 times faster or more slowly than the orbital period and uh, and so on. So here uh, on each of these plots, you have two main uh, distributions. One that is here. So it's hard to see with uh, the lighting conditions, but basically you have a black line here in most of these plots. Uh, this is a population of synchronized closed uh, systems. And the diagonal here, that is the rotation rate we started from. So we start from a rather, rather high rotation rate and it goes down to synchronized enclosed systems. It remains high because tides are not very efficient in distant systems, which is kind of expected. Here, uh, you can see that there is some synchronicity in all of the four panels, whether you use uh, BSC tides or mint tides, or whether you use Gaussian or Mo and Stefano initial distributions. Uh, what you find also is that uh, you have more synchronized systems on the bottom plots here than on the top plots. So mint tides are more efficient at synchronizing systems than BSC tides. On the contrary, this is for uh, this, the, the previous plot, sorry, here, this is for M35 our solar-like convective envelope star system, uh, cluster. For the very massive O-star cluster that has uh, radiative tides going on, uh, we perform the same calculation. We still find some synchronized systems here and there. Um, we still find that diagonal popu population from very rapid rotators. Um, but what we see here is that uh, mint tides give you some synchronized systems, but BSC tides give you more. So in this case, mint tides, mint dynamical tides are less efficient than the BSC dynamical tides, while we just saw that mint equilibrium tides are more efficient than BSC equilibrium tides. So again, uh, I showed you plots. Now let's do some statistics. What we do for the statistics is we focus on this synchronized population that is between plus and minus 0 0.2 on this uh, vertical axis, so close to synchronicity, and below 1.5 uh, in log p. So systems that are closer than 30 days in period that are synchronized, we isolate those and we compare their number to the total number of systems outside uh, here that are not synchronized or uh, wide. And what we find, so here's the thing I just explained. What we find is uh, that 
there is a way of different differentiating the two prescriptions we use for type. To do that, uh, we assess the fraction of systems that are close and synchronous, so that match these two criteria, versus age. So for M35 that has only equilibrium types going on, they start by being obviously at the, in the same location, and they just the stars just formed, size didn't have time to impact anything. But when we evolve that through time, uh, the various lines here are for different rotation prescriptions, and the colors are basically for the tidal prescription, uh, all conditions put together. What we see is that mint tides tend to more to create more synchronized systems for equilibrium tides for M35 compared to BSC tides. This is what I just said before. Mint tides are more efficient. Mint equilibrium tides are more efficient, so you have more synchronized systems. Uh, on the contrary, for tarantula, this is the same plot. You find that mint and BSC tides are basically the same near the zero H main sequence. And then they diverge, and BSC tides create more synchronized systems than mint tides. There's one caveat here. Uh, my age on this plot goes from 0 to 10 mega years, and tarantula is actually somewhere between 1 and 7 mega years. So we're still more or less in this confused region. But if we wait 3 million years to do the observation, or uh, we look at an older cluster, your choice, um, we would see a difference. And that difference is significant, actually. Here, uh, for instance, on, for M35, in one case, you have 40%, 50% of the systems that are synchronized. In the other case, you have between 5 and 25. So this means, in one case, you would see a synchronized system for each non-synchronized system, while in the other case, you would see one, uh, well, three synchronized systems, sorry, one for three. So, well, your ratio would be significantly different. Um, and these two plots show that we, re we basically recognize this, the behavior we expected from computing E and E2 for those stars. So we, we uh, contend that synchronicity can be a measure of tidal efficiency. So this is the conclusion for the tides work I've done. Basically, um, equilibrium tides can be distinguished early. Uh, we have to wait a bit more to distinguish between dynamical tides in the synchronicity experiment. So in the end, circularization on the main sequence does not give you any uh, age constraint, but uh, synchronicity, synchronicity might, well, will give you a difference, uh, an assessment of tidal efficiency. But obviously, that's my theoretical, uh, well, theoretical science background speaking, more observations are needed. Um, that's the usual conclusion, right? Um, okay, all these results are in a paper that we submitted and resubmitted, so it should go through uh, anytime soon now uh, in MNRS. Um, okay, now I just want to mention two uh, studies I've collaborated to that rely on my Mint algorithm. I'm not the main author, so I'm not going to give you too much detail, um, but they're about population three stars. So population three stars have Z equals zero, no metals. Um, this is the, the this these are the, the main well the, the first stars created in the universe. They're expected to be more massive, bigger than the stars we see today, and they processed obviously the first uh, material and they created the first metals, but they were metal free. Uh, we cannot see well we do not see any of these stars anymore because they evolved and they were too massive to survive to this point in time, but we can still see signatures of them at higher redshifts. One of those signatures is the very famous 21 centimeter signal, which is redshifted light from those original stars. Um, and what we computed is the signature in the 21 centimeter band. Um, by evolving the stars, I computed for my grid, mint grid. Uh, and what we change here is the initial mass function. So we found that the signature depends strongly on the highest masses you put in the initial mass function. So if you exclude very, very massive stars, your uh, signal is much dimmer, basically. And the uncertainties we have on the, the amplitude of that signal generated from those massive stars is of the order of the sensitivity of the current experiments to measure the 21 centimeter signal. So what we hope is that future detectors with better sensitivities will give us measurements that will let us 
decide uh, which of the IMFs we can keep or which ones we, can, we need to exclude. Uh, this has also been submitted to MNRAS and should be out soon. A second experiment still with population three stars is the X-ray signature of those stars. So I told you those stars are very massive. So what, they, what very massive stars do is evolve rapidly and give a, a black hole as a remnant at the very end of the scenario. So if you have a binary with one of those very massive stars, quite rapidly, you will have a binary that has a compact object and a normal star. When that normal star evolves, it gets bloated, and there's mass transfer triggering that will drop mass on the compact object. Because they're so small, they create a disk that is very hot, and the very hot disk emits X-ray light. Um, so we were able to model this whole process in binary C compute a population of metal free stars that will go, uh, some of which will Okay, sorry, uh, Zoom people, I'm back. Um, so yeah, uh, basically I was telling you about this IMF signature that gives you either intense short-lived signatures or uh, less, well, dimmer, longer-lived signatures. Well, we're able to find a trade-off that uh, corresponds to the observed signatures. There's one big uh, thing that came out of this study is, is the importance of pair instability supernovae. So pair instability supernovae appear in massive but not too massive stars and they basically destroy the star without leaving a remnant. It's a very specific pipeline for supernovae but uh, by destroying the star you damp significantly the signature and uh, the, the x-ray signature in x-ray binaries and uh, the, the, the amount of damping you have might uh, give you an idea of the relevance of those parent stability supernovae uh, and how much, uh, how many we expect to have happened. Um, so this is the end. Uh, just to conclude, uh, we did this population synthesis to model clusters. I showed you two of them, but we actually studied seven. Uh, we always find the same result. Circularization cannot constrain tide efficiency because that's not circularization is not happening on a main sequence. It happened before, it happens later, but it does not happen on the main sequence. Uh, however, synchronization carries an age-dependent signature even on the main sequence. So we need to observe that, and maybe we will be able to constrain tides. Um, there are plenty of applications to the Mint code. Um, so I'm wrapping it up. Uh, once it's nice, user-friendly, uh, we will release it both in a paper and obviously in a and make it public either through downloading the code or using it online. Uh, among the applications, you have plenty of things. You can compute chemical yield, the rates of your favorite event, the number of stars you expect in your favorite configuration. Um, Z equals zero grid led, led us study population three stars, but there are many other things we can do. And basically this list is open. And if you want to uh, know more and work with these tools, I'd be happy to uh, collaborate. That's it. Thank you for your attention. Thanks. So thank you very much, Giovanni. And now the talk is open for questions. So for the in-person here, uh, you need to approach with the micro to the person that, oh, okay. uh, or you, you can take audio and move it.
And from the persons in uh, Zoom, please uh, yeah. raise your hand and then ask your questions. I can do it here. Okay. okay. Well, if you have any questions, uh, Adrian. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you so much for your nice talk. It's a great job, a really interesting. And taking into account the last issue, you write your idea goes here. <laughs> I would like to suggest uh, something. Uh, uh, perhaps it's a crazy idea, but what do you think about trying to introduce exoplanets in binary system? Because as far as I know, the process of, of uh, circu uh, circularization could be interesting in order to, to be able to predict if in this binary system, uh, exoplanets and eventually life could uh, evolve or not. Perhaps it's too ambitious, but perhaps it's interesting to, to deal with this uh, topic. So thanks for the question. Um, I'll come back here in front of my camera. Um, yeah, so exoplanets is actually a thing that is being introduced in binary C. So, so far, uh, it's been a student project more than anything. So stars, uh, yeah, stars evolve, but planets are considered as like inert mass points. Um, but we were able to evolve um, populations, including planets, and to uh, count uh, what kind of planets we had. So what we can do easily is uh, statistics. So if you change your initial distribution of well, planetoids, I suppose, around the star, how uh, well, how will the final star, final planet be distributed? How many hot Jupiters do you expect, and so on? Life is a much more complicated matter because you don't know, you not only need uh, the planet to be in the right location with respect to the star, but you also need it to have the proper properties uh, in terms of atmosphere and stuff like that. And this is still way beyond what we've done so far. And it would probably require more work outside of the binary C code. Binary C is very good at computing the orbits, so you can compute also orbits for planets, but well, not more from that point of view, I suppose. No, well, uh, okay, so uh, Adriana did a comment on uh, planets in binary systems and the stability of such systems or such planetary orbits. Um, okay, so at the moment, binary C also has uh, triple systems in. So what you describe as a binary system that has a planet, from my point of view, is just a triple system with a smaller star that's not a star. Um, that can be evolved and you can find whether this is stable or not. Mergers are also part of the code. So you would know that your planet basically collapsed into one of the stars. Now, what we know is that probably uh, a binary system plus one planet can be stable because we observe those. We observe, you know, P or S uh, planetary orbits, whether you have one planet that rotates a system or uh, one planet that rotates around one of the two stars with a companion further out. These things we observe and we're able to implement in the code. The only thing is your planet will not dissipate any energy through tides at the moment, for instance, because we just use mass points. So we would have to take planet structure into account at some point to study the stability you mentioned properly. At the moment, basically, you would have the stability of your binary system. And as long as the planet doesn't literally cross one of the two stars, well, then it would remain there. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Sir? Okay. Uh, thank you, Giovanni. But my, my question is, is uh, going 
connected to the uh, clustering cell and, and how the these binary stars evolve inside the stellar system. When you have a detached binary system, but you have a very massive of a very concentrated galactic cluster, as for example, Tarantula. So the problem is that many of them can become or must transfer binary of even to broke the stellar system and became runaway star. Okay, uh, for example, in your a statistic for the tarantula cyst or the tarantula cluster. Do you take into account the possibility the transformation of this system to the other, uh, you know, to the? Right. That's a question. Yeah, thank you for the question. Indeed, that's uh, that's also an issue. So uh, we try to focus here on open clusters because we wanted to have clusters that were not too dense to avoid triple interactions, for instance. Indeed, Tarantula is not that uh, not dense. It's quite dense. Um, and uh, I might have turned it off. OK, uh, so um, in this specific case, for this study, as soon as the system would start trans transferring mass because of Roche lob overflow, we would stop the track and exclude that from the system, or we would stop evolving that thing. So we do not have cases of rush of the flow mergers and runaway systems because of that. We do not either. We do not have uh, runaway systems also because we st we just evolve those systems on the main sequence. None of the stars involved have the time to go supernova and leave their companion alone. But yeah. Uh, in the code, we can compute runaway systems. So at some point, you can. You asked me if we include a single and binary stars. Yeah, we even include binary stars that become single at some point during the evolution by assigning them basically a massless companion, a massless remnant companion, and that works well technically and scientifically. Um, so yeah, the runaway stars are included to some extent, should be included. But uh, we uh, well, we didn't need them in this part in this study. Any other question? A question in the Zoom. Hello. I don't see. I can't see the chat actually. So. So if none, we can close the talk. Uh, thank you very much again, Giovanni, for this uh, nice talk. Thank you for having uh, me. See you all next week. Thank you. Thank you.